to NURFM.com, a broadcast service of the University of Newcastle. Joining us in the studio today, Dr Ezekiel Emanuel. He's an oncologist, a bioethicist, a highly regarded scholar, doctor, policymaker from America who's come to Newcastle for the very first time. Dr Emanuel, hello and welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming to Newcastle for the first time. What are your first impressions of our fair city? I love the beach. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Everyone says it the reminded same. me of my childhood jumping the waves on Sunday. So, Whereabouts was that childhood, sir? Uh, well, I spent a lot of summers in Israel, and so I jumped the Mediterranean waves. Beautiful. Now you're here tonight for the very first in our Global Insights series. What is it that you're going to be raising in tonight's talk at City Hall? So I was asked to talk about end-of-life care and the role of euthanasia in end-of-life care, and so I'm going to be looking at a lot of uh, both the arguments about the proper way to care for dying patients and the data we have about how patients around the world, not just in Australia, but uh, predominantly in the United States and other countries, uh, die, and the role uh, that euthanasia may or may not play in uh, improving end-of-life care. Speaking about the way people die here in Australia, at the moment there are two elderly people per week who die at their own hands very tragically and often in very violent ways. That is not a good thing. Talk to me about what you would like to see happen in places like Australia. How can we stop those deaths and and how can we improve it? Well, uh, let's see, that uh, two a week is about 100 people a year and you probably have 230,000 or 200,000 deaths a year. Um, I am always one who likes to concentrate on the big numbers, Mm. and the big numbers are people who aren't grabbing headlines but are dying. Uh, I would suspect that in Australia, I don't know the data, but a lot of people die in the hospital who would prefer to be at home. Uh, The symptom management is probably not optimal. Um, And I think those are the things we need to concentrate on. One of the reasons I don't think euthanasia and assisted suicide, despite all the attention both of the press uh, and others, uh, is not a solution to uh, improving end-of-life care is that it's really uh, only a small minority of people use it. Uh, Even in places like the Netherlands and Belgium, which have had legalized euthanasia-assisted suicide for years and decades, tolerated the practice, um, less than one in 30 people use euthanasia-assisted suicide at the end of life, and less than 10% of dying patients even think about it. Uh, So if you're really interested in improving end-of-life care, euthanasia-assisted suicide is not the answer. Uh, You've got to be interested in the other 97% of people who are not using euthanasia-assisted suicide, and you have to improve their care. And so, again, I like to go for the big numbers. That's where your biggest improvement is going to happen. And for them, it's really about symptom management, uh, being at home, being able to stay at home uh, with loved ones and creating an infrastructure that can facilitate that. Is that where palliative care really comes into this? And I've interviewed people who volunteer to be palliative care Mm -hmm. workers, and they often tell me that in amongst the tragedy that is happening with some families, it is some of the happiest and most rewarding times for those palliative carers. Is that the key to this? Is it about human beings taking care of others at potentially the most grievous time in their life? So uh, uh, palliative care is absolutely essential uh, for high-quality end-of-life care, making sure those symptoms, uh, whether they're pain or shortness of breath or fatigue or nausea and vomiting, uh, don't uh, uh, overwhelm a patient and a family. And so it really is integral to high quality uh, end of life care. And uh, it is meaningful. The end of life is a very value laden moment where people come to uh, look at their uh, life and its meaning and, and the quality of their life and their relationship with family members and with others. And so it is a profound privilege to help people reconcile at that moment and and understand the meaning and value of their life. Uh, And I think that's, uh, in the end, what gives people uh, a real purpose in their life, having a sort of understanding of meaningful contributions they've made, meaningful relationships they've had. That's really what it is about. And that's why it tends to be a very, uh, a very profound and emotionally salient moment, both for the people who are dying, obviously, but also for the caregivers, uh, whether family or others. Sir, it's been reported, and you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, but uh, you've said that you'd be happy to be 
taken away to die at 75, you think that most of your life will be complete by then. You've, you'll have achieved what you wanted to achieve. Can I ask you, how old are you now? Uh, first of all, I'm 58, and second of all, that's a slight distortion of what I said. Uh, and that's why I'd like to clarify it. Please <laughs> so do. What, what I wrote is that uh, I'm going to stop taking medical treatments where the purpose of the medical treatment is to extend my life. Uh, I will have had, uh, you know, again, thinking about what makes a valuable life, it seems to me that there are three important components. One is meaningful work and meaningful contribution to your family, your community, the world. Another is meaningful relationships with people. And a third is play, a vocational interest, what uh, uh, isn't work, but it can be uh, important. Um, and I think that uh, both meaningful relationships and meaningful work require a lot of mental acuity, physical uh, stamina. Mm. And if you look at the data, and again, I tend to be a data-driven person, uh, the chance of getting Alzheimer's dramatically increases after 75, uh, so that by 85, a third to a half of people have mental, have uh, 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 cognitive problems. Um, even if you don't have full-blown Alzheimer's, your mental processing ability slows down. Almost none of us make creative contributions after that time. Your ability to have a meaningful relationship intimately depends upon your mental abilities, your cognitive abilities, uh, and also physical stamina and physical uh, uh, living without disability also declines substantially. The notion that we're going to live healthy and vigorous lives and then fall off the end of a cliff uh, and die in our sleep or something is a sort of myth. Uh, we all want that. We all sort of believe somehow we'll be the special one, uh, we'll be the outlier. Um, I'm much more uh, sober about it Outliers are, by definition, rare. All of us can't be outliers. We're much more likely to develop Alzheimer's, to end up in places like nursing homes or dependent upon other people. I don't want that for my life. Uh, and living as long as possible is not a goal I find uh, important. It's a, actually a goal I find unimportant. And I think living a full and meaningful life is much more important. And if you can't get it by 75, it's unlikely the next five years till you're 80 or 85 is going to give it to you. You have to really figure it out before that time. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel joining us in studio today. And yet, sir, with due respect, you say you feel that the quality portion of your life will be lived by 75. Yet on the other end of the spectrum, you are a vehement opponent of euthanasia. Of legalizing euthanasia, absolutely. I just don't think it's the answer to the question. If the question is how to have a, uh, a good end-of-life care experience, the answer to that question is not euthanasia-assisted suicide. As a matter of fact, I think that's a false answer, and it tends to be an answer given by uh, uh, upper-middle-class people who are uh, well-educated and have always been in control of everything and think they should be in control of everything else. First of all, that's the 1%, and second of all, it's, uh, it's a bit of a false uh, goal. Uh, it is interesting, though, isn't it, that such divergence of opinion, such disagreement comes from a position of actually wanting to care in whatever shape or form that takes for people in their dying days. I, I think of this in terms of the euthanasia argument, and there is such such disagreement across very learned people about well, well, this. What, uh, first of all, uh, it seems to me that for a lot of people, uh, it's an answer because the end-of-life care experience hasn't gone well. Mm. You've got to solve that problem because, again... Euthanasia-assisted suicide is something that a very small minority of people, one, you know, the top 1% are going to use. It's not for the majority of us. No. Uh, and so if you really care about people's meaningful end, focusing on euthanasia-assisted suicide is not the answer. That is a distraction. It's a sideshow. And I think people need to be clear. The second point I would make is all the data we have about euthanasia-assisted suicide and who uses it, it's not about people in extreme pain. That is a false notion. That's a false notion that's infiltrated the debate in Australia. If you look at the data, and I'll talk about that tonight in my lecture, the reason people seek euthanasia-assisted suicide is depression, hopelessness, being tired of life. Now let's look at those. Those are the reasons people commit suicide. Euthanasia-assisted suicide is just another form of suicide with the doctor uh, blessing it and helping. That doesn't seem to me to be the place we ought to be going. Mm. Uh, we deal with depression and hopelessness and tiredness of life in a different way, not in a way of saying, yes, it's time to end your life. And Doctor. again, I think there are lots of false misconceptions in this debate in 
as, as far as I can see it, in Australia. I'm not an expert on the debate, but I have read a number of things that lead me to believe uh, we're not being honest about the nature of euthanasia-assisted suicide. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is speaking this evening at City Hall. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a 5.30, 5.45 for a 6 p.m. start. Doctor, thank you for your time and enjoy our city and all the best for the lecture series. It's been my pleasure to be here.